Welcome. This is uh, a talk on memory barriers in practice for software engineers. Um, memory barriers. There are these uh, scary advanced multiprocessor synchronization things which if you don't get them right, then your code doesn't really work, maybe, but sometimes it does work until you run out of a new CPU on a different microarchitecture, and then it starts to behave in very weird ways, and it's, a, it's kind of hard to, you know, you, there's, there's a lot of lore around memory barriers, uh, and um, you kind of don't want to encounter them, but they, you know, they slow your code down, but also they make it... It's a, this talk is to uh, uh, present a uh, simpler view of what you need to know about memory barriers for software engineering. This is not a mathematical talk about formal memory models. You can find that somewhere else. This is uh, a talk about how to do engineering with memory barriers. Uh, now, there's a, a TLDR. Um, Memory barriers uh, are always there to order four different memory operations. You have some memory operations in some section A, and then a memory barrier, and then a store where you write to some pointer, some location memory on one CPU. Another CPU, you load from that, uh, that, uh, that same memory location and issue another memory barrier, and then some other memory operations in B using the value you read from it. Now, there's four things going on here. There's A, there's the store at B, sorry, there's the store at, uh, at location P, there's a load from location P, and there's more memory operations at B. So four different things on two different CPUs. Memory barriers always come in pairs. And when you put the memory barriers in pairs like this, so that one barrier ordering up some operations on one CPU, matches up with the other memory barrier ordering operations on the CPU, then you're guaranteed some very simple reasoning. It's as if the logic in A happened before the logic in B in a traditional sequential CPU, where you don't have to think about multiprocessing things. It's as if you just went step by step in program order. Um, excuse me. <laughs> um, and that's the main thing that you need to know about memory barriers. They order four different operations. So if you're reviewing code that has barriers in it and you see a barrier somewhere, the first thing you should think about is, OK, where's the corresponding barrier that another part of code uses? Maybe the same barrier, but another, another CPU will be executing at some point. And what are the four memory operations that need to be ordered to uh, uh, work out your protocol? The second line is uh, a simpler version of the same thing, uh, combined in uh, some architectures a little bit faster to uh, use a store release and a load acquire. Um, and then there's a little optimization with uh, read-only users that I'll get to later. The real red flag that you should watch out for it, it, that indicates something is likely very incoherent, probably doing something wrong, is when you see a store before load barrier. Um, that only appears in really obscure protocols like Decker's algorithm, which usually exists only to scare undergraduates in university away from looking at multiprocessor synchronization. You don't ever see Decker's algorithm in, in the real world for the most part. Um, this entire talk is at the URL here. Unfortunately, I don't know how to put a QR code into an Emacs buffer, and this is a very code-heavy talk, which is why I'm presenting it in Emacs as uh, a live editor session. Um, so if you want to uh, grab this code, uh, grab this, this, this slide to, to follow along at your own pace, you're welcome to do so. Um, except I'm going to move to the next slide now, so uh, it's going to go away. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, basic multiprocessor business. Uh, you know, let's suppose we have a counter, C, and we have a function count, which adds one to C. You call count a thousand times, C will go from 0 to 1,000. Simple, simple sequential machine logic. Of course, if you um, uh, run, the, uh, uh, run this on a multiprocessor system, things will be a little bit different. But let's first break this down into uh, three separate things, as if we're on a risk architecture with uh, loads and stores. So we first load this count function. We first load C into a temporary variable, T, then compute one more than C, this computation, one, uh, T plus equals one, purely local inside registers, not, doesn't touch memory outside. And then we write back T to C. Um, when I say load and read, those are synonymous. When I say write and store, those mean the same thing. 
So load, store, read, write, same deal. Just different words because different cultures merged in computing history. Um, okay, so uh, you know, obviously, you know, if you've ever done any multiprocessing computation, you know, if you call count a thousand times on two different CPUs, the result C might not be 2,000. It might be 1,972. Um, because uh, when you uh, step through this program, well, the execution might be interleaved. CPU 1 might load the value of C, let's say it's 782. CPU 2 also loads 782 at the same time. They both increment and both write back 783. And now two different calls to count have only counted once. Uh, so we need to have a mutex uh, to uh, um, ensure that this is uh, ordered so that when we are running the count function uh, for the, uh, trying to use this global state, um, we only want one CPU at a time to be able to touch that global state. Uh, now, of course, on a multiprocessor system, we want to do many things, but ideally we have fine-grained locks um, for certain applications so that one CPU can be working on one counter, another CPU can work on another. But if they happen to be using the same one, then we need a, uh, we'll need a mutex to uh, ensure that the count function runs as if it were on a sequential machine. Um, this is a uh, very simple-minded way to do a mutex. Um, we'll use the uh, atomic exchange instruction on x86. Um, this, uh, this will, uh, it's a test and set, uh, th this, this test and set function. It will return whatever value is at memory location, uh, our lock here, L, and at the same time it will store one at that location. And w the way we use this is uh, L is zero when it's free and one when it's locked. Um, so this is a very simple spin lock, very, very simple-minded, nothing exciting going on here. Um, not going to perform very well because if two CPUs run at the same time, there's no exponential back-off to make sure that there's, you know, this is not, perform this is not for performance, this is for illustration. Um, so uh, when we want to count up, we will uh, repeatedly test and set to see was it unlocked and try to lock it. And if it was unlocked, great, we're good. If it was already locked, we try again. Uh, and then we go through the critical section uh, to increment the counter, as in a sequential model, as in the you know, straight line uh, uh, serial machine. And when we're done, we unlock the, uh, uh, unlock the mutex. And ideally, if we did this right, uh, we would end up with, um, let's say, two CPUs call count a thousand times. Then C at the end should be 2,000. Unfortunately, uh, some things are conspiring in this uh, computer, this, uh, this demonic uh, shimmering silicon crystal, to screw us up so that it's not going to turn out 2,000 all the time. Not going to work out sequentially. Um, one problem is the compiler assumes that, generally assumes that uh, without a special instruction, uh, it can reorder things as if reorder sequential statements as if they were written in a different way if it doesn't change the way that the program would run on a sequential machine. So the compiler can take this uh, L equals zero and do it earlier because there's nothing, nothing that would, if you ran this program on a single CPU, nothing that would change if you did that. Um, so if we do that, then the critical section is no longer locked and we'll go back to the same problem of two CPUs stomping on each other's reads and writes at the same location. Um, so, um, uh, going back to the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, same code, with, uh, we need to fix this to make sure that it, uh, the compiler doesn't do this. Um, oh, sorry, uh, this is to illustrate uh, in practice that the compiler will actually do this. Um, I, I, I didn't use x86 here, this is ARM assembly code, but I actually ran this, put this code into, into GCC, and not only did it... Um, uh, yes, and I put this code in the GCC, and it, uh, it actually did reorder the uh, stores so that the store of L uh, to unlock the mutex comes out first before we've updated the counter. Um, GCC very helpfully optimized the code for us in a way that broke it. Uh, of course, that's because we didn't tell GCC that we want to do this on a multiprocessor machine, and GCC was well in its right to do this. So um, to fix the compiler part of things, uh, before we get to another part of this, uh, this uh, demonic shimmering silicon system, uh, we can put in instruction barriers. So the problem that happened up here is that when GCC was issuing 
uh, load, store, and add instructions, it just reordered the instructions that it generated for the, for the machine. Um, and we can ask GCC to please do not reorder those. Uh, put in an ASM volatile block. Uh, this is magic that says, GCC, you cannot assume that anything in memory is as it was before the ASM volatile block. And you can't delete this either. Um, so this means that when GCC uh, uh, um, um, uh, sees memory operations, sees a load and a store and a store, it can't reorder the memory operation before with the memory operation after in the code that it generates. So it comes out much better. We wind up with uh, the critical section as we intended, load add store of C, and then we release the lock. So great, we, we have a, a simple way to make the compiler stop trying to do things the wrong way behind our back. Um, however, the compiler is only part of the system. Uh, in a sense, uh, there's, a, there's sort of a pipeline here. You feed, uh, you feed programs into, into your compiler, and the compiler uh, transforms those into machine instructions, which, then feed them, which are then fed into CPUs. And the CPUs are wired on a system bus with a shared memory. So there are multiple little CPU cores all spinning around doing computation, and they're all wired to a shared memory. And the CPUs transform those machine instructions into memory transactions on the CPU bus. So there's a, there's a whole pipeline here where we found a way to prevent the compiler from reordering machine instructions. We now need to make sure that the CPUs will do the right thing as well. Actually, the story is a little more complicated because there are uh, shared memory, there are CPU cores with cache interconnects uh, and, and different levels of caches, and it's, it's all very messy. Um, but uh, we're not going to go into those details for now. This, is about how to, this talk is about how to do engineering with the memory barriers as components. Not, I'm not going to go into details of how the uh, messy cache procurance protocol works. That's all at, the, at a lower level. This is how to write software. OK, so uh, the basic problem is that we don't want this interleaved execution. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we, you know, if, if, if we're trying, running on two different CPUs, this, this situation here is not allowed to happen. Um, this, this, uh, this flies in the face of the, the sequential, you know, sequential logic that we wrote in our, in our program. Um, we want it to be serialized, uh, it, it, well, not necessarily serialized, but we want, to, we want to, to be able to reason about it as if it were serialized um, in, in, in this example of a, of a counter. Well, we, we want it to be serialized in this example of a counter. Later on, we'll want to avoid serialization because we want multiple CPUs for performance. But um, uh, for this example, we're, we're just looking at serialization of you know, running as, as, if it's a, as if in serial on, uh, on one CPU. So um, let's recap this. Uh, we have three parts here. There's the lock acquisition. We, we're taking the lock. And once we have taken the lock, we expect, OK, we have exclusive access to the counter memory. Nobody else can be touching it right now. No touchy. Um, and then we can do our business as if we're the only CPU in town. There's nobody else trying to interfere with us. And then we want to release the lock so that another CPU can take over and continue counting. Um, so we, we have these, these three, three parts, the lock acquisition, critical section, and lock release. Um, so uh, um, one, uh, sorry, one view of things is that uh, between these sections, we need to uh, ensure some kind of ordering here. Uh, and that is to put an, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll call it an acquire barrier and release barrier between, the, between these two sections. Um, but this isn't actually quite the, the view that it's, uh, that it's important to know about when you're looking at, at the implementation of a mutex. I mean, when you're using a mutex, yeah, you just want to say mutex enter, mutex exit, or, or whatever. Um, but when you're looking at how it works under the hood, or uh, if you're building a synchronization primitive under the hood, it looks, it's tempting to say that, well, this acquire should be paired across a critical section with this release. But that's, that's not the view that you need to be thinking about, because um, you actually need to think about where two different threads or two different CPUs are coordinating. So this is a single thread view of what one thread is doing at a time, one, one thread is doing at a time. But you need to have a view of the two different threads that are coordinating. So on CPU 0 or thread 0, when I say CPU or thread, it's the same, same deal. It's a, multi, a parallel thread of execution of some sort. Um, so on CPU 0, we've been, doing a, we've been working through this critical section. 
Uh, we loaded a counter value, we incremented it, or you know, then wrote it back, or there's some other data structure that we're updating or, or whatnot. So we want to make sure that in order to have the sequential idea of programming, that is in order to, to make, do sequential reasoning about programming, uh, we want to make sure that the critical section that ha on CPU A, CPU 0, all happens before, as if it had been in sequence on one CPU, the corresponding critical section on the other CPU, on CPU 1. So when we're ordering access to the memory, we have four memory operations here that need to be ordered, or more, four or more. Uh, there's the, the memory operations in the critical section on CPU A. There's the store to release the lock. And if that release is witnessed by the other CPU, by CPU 1, then when it does a test and set, and it observes that the, that the lock value is now 0, then there's a synchronization event between these so that the barriers guarantee everything in critical section A on CPU 1 has happened before everything in critical section B on CPU, sorry, on CPU 0, everything before uh, uh, the critical section B on CPU 1. Uh, and once you have that, anything that you would have written on a single CPU in a, in a you know, single sequential machine, any reasoning you have about data structure invariance for uh, the critical section A guaranteed is also guaranteed when critical section B begins. So we want the A to happen before B. Um, and that is, that, is, that is what the pairing of release barrier, memory operation on CPU, one, CPU 0, corresponding memory operation on, on CPU 1, and the acquire barrier do. They guarantee that everything in A happens before everything in B. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, we, so we, the way we do this is to uh, uh, ensure that um, well, we, we, we have CPU barriers that will put everything that was on CPU, uh, critical section A and CPU 0, make sure that that has completed by any other CPUs once we do the store, and then the corresponding thing on the other, the, on the other CPU, an acquire barrier. Uh, in NetBSD, we spell it with membar release and membar acquire. Um, these are actually relatively new. There used to be a different set of membars in NetBSD. Um, we recently changed it to match, to better match the literature on this and what is actually useful in um, uh, most software. Um, and, uh, the, the member exit and enter are now deprecated, and I'll, I'll mention them later, but it's, 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 you can forget about them. Uh, release and acquire are the important ones. These are, the, for the most part, the only two barriers you ever need to use uh, in uh, in, in realistic real-world code. Um, now there's also, uh, uh, you can, so if you look at the membar release and store, this operation can be combined on some CPUs more efficiently with a co combined store release instruction, like in, uh, on the ARM, STLR um, is a store release instruction. And similarly, uh, the, uh, and it, sometimes atomic operations can imply an acquire barrier so that this can all be done as one, um, one uh, atomic swap acquire operation. Actually, we don't have that name in NetBSD just yet. You can spell it in C11. Um, but the, in, in principle, the, these, these, are this, these are the same thing. Um, release and store, uh, or uh, atomic operation and acquire, or just load and acquire. Um, but the combined operations are sometimes clearer and sometimes uh, a little more efficient. Uh, you, can, you can write it both ways. Either way works. Um, well, in, in NetBSD right now, you'd have to, you'd have to put in uh, a member, uh, use this atomic swap member acquire, but we might change that eventually. Uh, in C11, you can use the combined operation. OK, so I've been talking about mutexes and about serialization. Um, and serialization is great, but we have multiple CPUs because we want stuff to happen in parallel. We don't, we don't want to serialize everything. Um, you know, if we serialize everything with a kernel locker, it's very slow. Uh, you know, Fine-grained locking can help. But also, there are times when, uh, for instance, in a packet processing path, there's data structures that we really don't want to have contention in memory over. We just want a bunch of CPUs to be able to load from them, read-only, and, uh, uh, and use them without having to issue writes to other CPUs witness. Because it's, if you have coordination with CPUs, that's, that's slower. That, that eliminates parallelism. Um, so one example we might have is uh, table lookup. Um, so 
when you are, let's say you have a table of, of, of roots or something, I don't know, a, 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 a table of, a table of user, user records or something. Um, and uh, so inserting or deleting things in this table may be exp an expensive operation. You don't care. It doesn't happen very often. Looking things up in the table needs to be fast, needs to be cheap. Um, so you don't want to have a, uh, you don't want to have to serialize insertion and lookup and insertion and lookup because that's, that'll, that'll slow you down. You want to be able to you maybe serialize insertion, 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 and also have lookup happen in parallel with as many CPUs as you want. Um, so uh, here's an example of a naive way to try to um, do unlocked table lookup. This is maybe the first way we'll try it. Uh, we have um, uh, insertion into the table uh, serialized. So we allocate, we lock the table, uh, allocate a record, um, initialize the record a little bit. Maybe each record will have its own fine-grained lock so that when you're using a record, two different records and two different CPUs, they don't have to wait for each other. They can work independently, but only one CPU at a time can touch that record. This is just an you know, example. Um, then we fill up some data. And once the record is in the table is ready, we mark it occupied. We say occupied equals true. And the idea of this approach would be that uh, we can try to do an unlocked lookup. So we don't have to take any locks at all to look up anything in the table. So any CPU at the, at, at the time in, on the, in the machine can do lookups. And so we check, OK, is it occupied? If not, go to fail, forget it, nothing is here. Um, uh, if we try again, this time, uh, assume that the, the, this, this software is running in, in, in sequence more or less. So uh, after occupied equals true, we look it up again. Uh, this time, it is, in fact, occupied. So we get uh, a record. We can get the tag. We can take a lock on the, the content of the record. And we can use some data in the, in the record, you know, whatever. So uh, uh, just some, uh, do some logic here. OK. Um, fortunately, again, the compiler might reorder things for us. Uh, we didn't put any, any barriers in here to prevent it. So where the compiler saw initialization of tag, and then the lock, and then, act, and then some data, and then occupied. It might just reorder those to be in some other order, because it found a better way to optimize the store instructions on the ARM CPU, which has fancy immediate values you can use to store bit patterns in special ways, and compilers can find clever ways to take advantage of that. So it might turn out with setting occupied equals true first. And that kind of puts a damper in our scheme to let Excuse me. Puts a different scheme to let CPUs uh, use the record as soon as it is occupied because it hasn't been initialized yet. So this is it's going to fall into some uninitialized data. So that's no good. Um, similarly, on the lookup side, uh, we might see the compiler might see well we're going to load the tag of this of this of this record uh, whatever a tag is um, maybe a packet flow for a, a root or something I don't know. Uh, uh, and, uh, well, we're going to do that, so we might as well get a start on it early, the compiler says. Um, and the compiler might move that to a little bit earlier, to before we even checked whether the record is occupied. And again, we might have some uninitialized garbage in here. Uh, so that's no good. Um, in order to make this work, we need barriers. We need to barriers to make sure that when you're looking up data, Everything that you use in the data um, has already been initialized. So the initialization, setting the tag, setting the, initializing the lock, setting the data, that all has to happen before the critical section in the user side. So we again have a critical section, but it's not unlike a lock where you have lock acquire, critical section, lock release. Um, the critical section on the two sides isn't actually really delimited that way. Uh, it's, uh, it's just the criti critical section sort of ends on the, on the, on the uh, creation side, and it begins on the lookup side. But again, it's not, it's not delimited as one CPU starts and then ends, and another CPU starts and then ends the way Mutex was. So it's a little bit, little bit different. And that's why the multi-threaded view of a Mutex even is important to think about instead of just the single-threaded view that I, I brought up earlier. Uh, again, you can use uh, a uh, store release and load acquire instead of uh, a store and uh, a, a member release and store together with uh, a load and member acquire. Same thing. Uh, doesn't doesn't make a difference. Uh, it's it's it can be a little bit more obvious uh, when you have store release that 
the uh, synchronization is happening at the point of the occupied variable. Um, but they, they both work. Um, I personally recommend using store release and load acquire. It makes it a little, little clearer, easier, easier audit, but uh, sometimes it's uh, not convenient for, for one reason or another. OK, so another issue that you might have uh, that requires barriers is reference counts. Um, so the idea of a reference count, uh, every, a lot of people in a big room, and they're trickling out, and the lights are on. Last one out, hit the lights. Um, so you keep a count of how many users there are. And on the very last reference, um, you uh, destroy the data and free the resource. Hit the lights, turn the lights out. Um, but uh, maybe a user is going to grab some data out of the object that you're, out of the resource that you're trying to release, out of the object you're trying to release. Um, so we, we, we grab some data out, and then we release the reference count. And let's pretend for the moment that minus minus is atomic in C. The atomicity question here is not the relevant point. It's, it, the point here is going to be about uh, memory ordering. I mean, I, I, could, I could replace this by atomic deck u and nv. Uh, I can replace that. But let's just, I'll just say minus minus for now to keep it simple. Um, and you know, maybe I don't actually memset here. Well, maybe I have to if I explicit memset. But uh, uh, maybe free does that internally as a diagnostic thing. The point is, something is going to overwrite the object with garbage. Uh, as soon as we free it. But once there's no more references, uh, that's OK, right? Because we're the last one holding the reference to this object, so nobody else can be touching it, certainly, right? Well, unfortunately, that's not right. Um, because again, uh, the compiler or CPU could conspire to uh, reorder the code in a way that makes no difference whatsoever in sequential execution but mm, poses a problem for us. Um, so we might load the data after we've decremented the reference count. What that means is that if there's two CPUs, one of which is decrementing the reference count and not the last user, they might decrement the count first. Then another CPU will go through. And uh, so we have the first CPU decrements the reference count, goes down to one. So we don't take this branch here. Um, the other CPU then decrements the reference count to 0 and destroys the object. Um, but the first CPU hasn't yet loaded the data. So now it loads this garbage that was, that was written in by the CPU that thought it was the last user. But it's not the last user because the CPU and the compiler were working against us to uh, screw this up, and we end up reading garbage out. Uh, and then the CPU1 eventually frees the object, and uh, CPU1 might return the right data, but CPU0 has returned garbage. Use after free. Of course, this is often very difficult to diagnose because this kind of use after free usually only happens when you know, very tight race conditions in high performance things, and it's just like one packet has two bytes of garbage in it or something, and uh, what's, what's up with that? You know, it's it's very, very hard to, hard to diagnose once uh, you hit it in the wild. Um, so uh, we can use uh, memory barriers to help us here. Um, and this time, uh, we're not just taking a, uh, a multi-threaded view the way that we had a multi-threaded view of the mutex, but we're using release first and then acquire, which is maybe counterintuitive. Um, but the reason that we're doing this is that we need to make sure that on one CPU, everything prior to decrementing the reference count happens before everything after decrementing the reference count. Um, so um, uh, uh, this way, when we, uh, did I not freeze? Yeah, I didn't, didn't draw a diagram of this. OK, anyway, the, the, uh, putting the memory barriers here rules out this, this, the, this ordering possibility um, so that uh, once, uh, so every single CPU that has ever been using the object uh, has completed using the object, has completed doing any memory operations in the, in the object. Uh, before another CPU can witness the reference count go down to zero and do anything after the member acquire. So putting the member release on one CPU guarantees that member acquire on the last CPU, on the other CPU, um, will witness, will observe all of the data having happened to happen first, uh, all the memory operations having happened first. Um, again, this is a little counterintuitive. I should have 
illustrated this one uh, with an, another walkthrough of the step-by-step, -step, but apparently I didn't, sorry. Um, so I uh, fixed a large class of bugs in NetBSD this year, uh, a few months ago, I don't remember when, uh, with uh, reference, all kinds of reference counts. Um, should probably consolidate some of that into uh, simpler abstractions so that we don't have to have copies of the membar calls all over the place, but um, at least large class of bugs fixed here um, just by inserting release and acquire around member ref uh, 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 around reference count decrement. And of course, yeah, you need to use a, uh, an atomic operation for real. You can't use uh, minus minus. Okay, now, um, as an um, optimization, um, when the producer is write-only and the consumer is read-only, uh, for instance, you're, you want to read out a set of event counters, but you want to have a consistent snapshot of that set of event counters. You want to make sure that it is exactly as it has been written at one point in time, not you know, partially updated. And these counters, there's way too many of them to do with a single atomic operation. Um, you know, may, you know maybe, maybe on some CPUs you even have a load linked store conditional that can work at up to a cache line at a time, so you can write 64 bytes atomically, but this is way too much even for that. So you need to get an atomic snapshot of it, but you want the snapshot to be cheap. You don't want to have to wait for anything when you're taking the snapshot, uh, or at least you don't want to have to um, wait for anything unless there's a, uh, you know, it's getting updated in the in, in middle, middle of an update or something. Um, so you, you, want, you want the snapshot to be cheap, and there's, no, there's nothing transferring data from the consumer to the producer. Um, so in this case, instead of using membar acquire and membar release, you can use the, on some CPUs, slightly cheaper membar producer and membar consumer. Um, producer just orders writes, just orders stores, uh, and membar consumer just orders loads, and that's it. Um, this is uh, called a seek lock in Linux. Um, and there's a, another variant of it, a Lamport variant of it, where, uh, so the, the Linux seek lock, you set a bit to indicate that uh, there's, um, a write an update in progress, then you update the, uh, update the data, and then you increment the version. And on the reader side, you check if there's an update in progress and wait until there's no update in progress, and then read out all the data. And if the version changed, you have to go back and start over. Um, similar thing with the Lamport, uh, uh, Lamport lock. Um, it's just you use two different version numbers instead of a bit and a version number. Um, but they, they can both take advantage of Membar producer, membar consumer, as very slightly cheaper. So, for example, on on ARM CPUs, uh, membar producer is very slightly cheaper, or can be cheaper anyway, than uh, membar release. Um, uh, same deal on RISC-V, um, uh, and so it's it's but it's it's a micro optimization. You can ignore producer and consumer and just use acquire and release, and that that'll that'll be fine. The red flag is store before load. So in NetBSD, in Solaris, in OpenBSD, there's this membar sync. Uh, membar sync uh, orders every possible combination of memory operations. And I haven't really gone into the details of load before load and load before store because I, I think it's di much more difficult to think about than just the four memory operations that you put an acquire barrier in one and a release barrier in the other, and that's it. Um, but membar sync orders all pairs of load and store operations, including store before load. Now, store before load is necessary in Decker's algorithm, um, which is this uh, kind of uh, clunky system for achieving mutual exclusion on a machine that doesn't have atomic operations. Now, most machines these days have atomic operations. In fact, it's been a long time since any serious machines that have multiprocessor systems lack atomic operations. In fact, this has pretty much been only useful for theoretical machines designed in academic purposes in the 1970s. Um, and this, so this, this uses a store before load barrier. Of course, your machine needs to have no atomic operations, but it also needs to have memory barriers in order for this to work. So there are even fewer machines, I think, that have memory barriers, but no uh, uh, atomic operations. So this, this is a very, very theoretical, theoretical uh, um, uh, a theoretical device, and it still needs an acquire barrier and a release barrier to bracket the critical section. So this is not useful. If you see membar sync, that's a red flag that something is probably going wrong here, and either this code has not been audited for an actual protocol, doesn't have a clear idea of which, which things are happening before which other things, 
or it's actually that's basically what it means. <laughs> or it's using a very bizarre protocol that you should maybe rethink because uh, Decker's algorithm is hard to reason about, it's hard to think about, uh, and it's usually slow. Um, the thing is, the store before load barrier usually has to stall the entire CPU pipeline. Um, all the other barriers, load before load uh, or acquire release barriers, um, they, uh, they, you know, uh, acquire barrier will, will stall the loads, and store, uh, a release barrier will usually stall the stores. But aside from that, the CPU can keep on executing, keep on reordering, and so on. Um, Membar sync is extremely expensive in contrast. Um, it's so expensive that even on x86, where uh, x86 has total, um, uh, total store order, and it is, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can often write entire uh, multiprocessor uh, uh, systems on x86 without even thinking about barriers because the memory ordering is so strong. Even on x86, Membar sync implies a barrier because x86 may take a store uh, and defer it until after a load. Uh, it doesn't reorder anything else except store before load. And uh, so Membar sync is most expensive, least useful, and indicates there's probably something screwy here. Maybe the code hasn't been audited. Maybe it's doing something stupid it shouldn't be doing. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a red flag. Uh, in, in NetBSD, we also uh, have uh, Membar enter and exit. Um, Membar enter is uh, just store before load and load before load. Um, but on all CPUs, um, except possibly RISC-V, but I'm not even sure about that, uh, it is just as expensive as Membar sync, so there's no performance advantage, but it has all the same red flags. Membar exit is a legacy uh, alias that just paired up with the name enter, exit, it's nice and memorable, um, but it's, it's the same thing as Membar release. Um, then we also have a few other barriers for other purposes. Um, out of the scope of this talk, I just mentioning briefly, um, uh, bus space barrier is for write combining memory types uh, or prefetchable. Um, x86 requires this uh, with uh, sfence and lfence, but it, for the most part, you don't have to you, know, you don't have to worry about it. It's um, uh, unless you're writing a graphics driver in the you know uh, graphics your kernel graphics stack frame buffer business. Uh, that's usually what it's used for. Um, and then bus DNF sync, uh, this is for when you're doing DMA operations uh, with the device driver. Um, again, not going to go into details, but the dri device drivers need to you use DNF sync to uh, 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 ensure ordering between memory operations done by a DMA engine and memory operations done by the CPU. Uh, Membar, the Membar functions, Membar acquire, Membar release, do not cooperate with I.O. devices. So you do need to use these when you're use doing I.O. Membar device, the Membar functions in FPSD are only for CPU-CPU synchronization. Um, and then one final note uh, uh, before I wrap up and, and take questions is that uh, most of these barriers are going to be inside the implementations of some synchronization abstractions. Uh, you don't usually use them in regular, regular driver code. Um, you know, if you're writing a mutex, if you're writing a, a, a mutex, a reader writer lock or something, you'll, you'll use barriers probably. Um, if, you're, if, you're, if you're writing a table, a data structure, a, a, a multi-threaded table that, that allows concurrent lookups and concurrent inserts or something. Um, you might use barriers or load acquire store release operations. But uh, in, in you know, driver code, in, 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 most, you know, in most application code, you don't use them directly. But it's sometimes important to notice, uh, you know, to, to understand where, you know, how to audit them, how to identify what, look, you know, what, what looks sensible, what looks non-sensible, how to tell whether it's correct uh, when, when you do encounter them. Um, so that's, uh, that's memory barriers. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Uh... I don't even know how much time I have left. I've been rambling for a while. That's a good question. <laughs> Oh, all right. Uh, Benny, are, are you slacking? <laughs> okay. Um, but I do have one comment for you, because yes. it's very similar thing in previous C. Um, like for a bus DMA map sync, sometimes yep. it is effectively like a CPU to CPU barrier. Yes. So the, you're not actually doing, um, the bus space barrier can be MemIO, in which case it's like sometimes you need an, like a kind of barrier or a cache loss or things, and sometimes you don't. 
but oftentimes with less DMA sync, you're actually writing to RAM. That's like in a descriptor ring, and it's a CPU in the device that's just kind of cooperating with. So it still needs to kind of the same type of barrier. In other words, you still you should have like a NumPy or something. Yes. So when you when you issue a bus DMA map sync, actually it's usually more expensive than MemBar because uh, it has to work both for um, I, I, you know, it, you have to bounce it, yeah. Oh yeah, bus DMA map sync deals with bouncing uh, and also with um, uh, and also with different memory types. If you have a write combining buffer, uh, which requires a barrier on x86 and ARM and everything else, uh, and so yeah, so bus DMA map sync is um, uh, it's it's usually more expensive and also even more necessary, even more important for a driver because the DMA engine. Uh, uh, it just doesn't work if if you don't have the right the right the right flushing happening sometimes. Sometimes you need, a, you need an explicit cache flush instruction. Um, so yeah, but you have think so it, it often has the effect of uh, a CPU barrier. The uh, the point I wanted to make is that uh, membar functions are not enough for device drivers to use to coordinate with uh, um, DMA engines. You'd need to use Bustion have sync. Membar the membar functions are only for CPU CPU synchronization. And they're they're often weaker than bus DMA, DMA map sync. Yes, yeah. So can you speak up a little bit? Oh, yes, there's a microphone. Amazing. I won't even have to repeat the question for the stream audience. <laughs> Lots of the problems you have raised are related to um, code being reordered, either by the CPU or the compiler. And it seems like this is a lot of this is related to the special requirements we have when working within the kernel. And um, things being a bit underspecified in the C specification, is there is there anything we could do or um, anything we should be doing to prevent unsafe compiler optimizations in the kernel? Well, so compiler optimizations are only part of the story. Um, the, the, the CPU will reorder memory operations even if the compiler executes in, in you know, a compiler generates machine instructions that are in the same order we wanted. Um, we can insert the, uh, these, ins these instruction barriers in here. Um, and well, on x86, this will, this will be enough. But on, on, on ARM, uh, this, this would not be enough. Um, so. Uh, you asked whether there's something we can do to um, uh, mitigate the unsafe compiler or maybe CPU optimizations. And the general answer is um, we can create uh, four classes of applications, uh, like mutexes. Uh, we can create an abstraction for it, like the mutex kernel API, instead of having those written, copied in every, in every application. Um, there are other, you know, other high-level abstractions that uh, that we can use. You know, in, in some cases, the right thing to do is uh, just make make software single-threaded with uh, event loops. Uh, in some cases, the the right the, the, the right the right approach is, is something else. Um, so uh, so yeah, for the most part, when you're writing a driver, when you're writing a, an, an application, you won't want to reach for membars. If you do want to reach for membars, you probably want to isolate them to an abstraction that has properties that are easy to reason about, like mutexes, um, uh, and then use that abstraction inside the rest of your, the rest of your code. Uh, sometimes maybe you want you know, Go routines in Golang or, your, or, or, uh, uh, or some higher level, higher level you know, concurrent, ML or con concurrent ML or concurrent Haskell or uh, you know, higher level abstractions like that. Um, or in, in Unix, maybe you just want to use pipes uh, in processes that are strung together that way, um, and, and you don't have to worry about membars in, in, in that kind of application. So you know, the um, general answer is, yeah, you, you isolate the difficult things to abstractions um, uh, and, and, and uh, make sure the abstractions have properties that you can use to reason, um, have contracts that, that enable reasoning. Um, but it's, it's a big subject, so uh, I'm not sure I can say anything more specific than that. Yes, there's a question down in the third row. 
Uh, so when you write code that uses, like when you're writing synchronization primitives that rely on memory barriers for correctness, what kind of techniques do you use to try and prove to yourself that the code is right beyond just kind of, you know, testing it? Because obviously that doesn't really... Yeah, so um, there are frameworks for formal verification. Um, the technique that I mostly use is to uh, make sure the logic is simple enough that I'm confident in it. <laughs> Um, if it is too complicated, then I conclude, nope, this is unverifiable, which, of course, is what an automated you know, machine prover will do, too. It will say, well, if this proof is too complicated for me to find, then unverifiable. Um, and uh, I think that's, that's usually a pretty good heuristic. Uh, something I, I often do is just annotate with a comment anytime there's a membar. What is the corresponding other matching membar? Uh, and that, that really helps with auditing. Um, you know, it's uh, it's not formal verification, and and, yeah, and there are tool, you know frameworks for that. Uh, they can get very complicated and hairy, and there's lots of academic research on them. And uh, I'm not the person to talk about that. This is actually this this is more about uh, how do you do practical engineering uh, without getting tripped up in, in all the academic details. Um, it'd be great if they if they were if they were more uh, readily usable for real world you know applications, but until they're ready to be integrated into Clang or something. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, they're, they're a little more specialist. Other questions? I'll, I'll point out if, if no one else has anything. There's, there is a cool suite of tools called Herd Tools. Um, called what? Herd, H-E-R-D tools. H-E-R-D tools. It's some framework for kind of dissecting memory models, and it's, it's written in OCaml, and they've got a bunch uh -huh. of command line tools. Yep. Um, and one of the, so I only found out about it recently, which is why I asked my question, but one thing you can do is write little snippets of assembly and say, you know, ARM64 assembly, uh -huh. and uh, write assertions about, you know, uh, the, the sort of the result um, of parallel executions of different snippets of code, yep. and it'll actually kind of produce you know all the all the possible interleavings, and it, it knows enough about the memory model of right, right. CPUs right. to to. So I, I guess I was wondering if if yeah you'd had any experience applying that to, to kernel code or anything like that because it's yeah I, I I have not applied that sort of thing to NetBSD development, um, but uh, if if you're interested in, in doing that uh, then we can talk because yeah. um, it so. In order for a tool, I mean, you can use it. You can use that kind of tool for initial development, and, that, and that's great. Um, for an OS kernel, you also want to, you know, if it, if you really want to make good use of it, you want it to be part of the, you know, automated tool chain that is used all the time. And um, you know, if we can do that, cool, that's great. Um, but it's, there's also a lot of engineering and likely academic work to to make it in sort of a, a more reliable thing that you can integrate into the, you know, a, a continuous build system and and, and so on. And, yeah. Yeah, um, but it'd be great if we could do that. I know of one similar effort to that, although I don't think it would be practical for us to use. Um, uh, some folks I know at Cambridge on a project, I think it was called REMS, they have a, it's a formal model, and so they have a formal execution model for ARM, a couple of the architectures. Yep. Um, but they're able to take like snippet, like you can basically make a small ELF and run it, and it'll do a similar thing where it enumerates all the paths. I think they actually found an upstream bug in Linux's mutex implementation on ARMv8 that way. <laughs> nice. Yeah. But I, I've, and I've talked to the professor in person because I work with him. Yep. Uh, and yeah. it, it's, it would be a clunky tool, for example, to automate into. Like, I don't know of anything that would be something you could fit in a tool chain in, like, in CI in a useful way. Yep. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, let's thank the speaker. Oh, thank you.